Well, we are going to continue our little journey uh, that we've been talking about finances uh, in the kingdom of God. Now, finances are an important part of life. Money is an important part of life. And I know that the image is that the church is just after your money. And as a way of trying to avoid reinforcing that, we generally don't talk about it. But God is interested in the whole of life. Amen. God is interested in everything. Uh, I just want to correct a statement I made last week because I went back and I listened to it just to make sure that what I said made sense. So I went back and listened and I picked up a little, little uh, mistake I made. When I was talking about passages in the, the Bible, New Testament and so on, that talk about various topics, I said this. I said, there are 500 verses on prayer. There's less than 500 verses on faith, but over 200 verses on finance and prosperity. Now, when I listened to that, I thought, if I was you, I would have gone... 500 on prayer, less than 200. What's your point? What's your big... Guess what? It's not 200, it's over 2,000. That was my point. I just want to clarify that. 500 verses on prayer. There's less than that on faith. There's over 2,000 references to finances and prosperity. So I just want to say that, that God has no problem talking about it. And so I don't think we should have a problem talking about it either. So we're just going to continue on with that. Matthew 6.33. Matthew chapter 6.33. Jesus said this. He said, but seek... Where? First. Now, that literally means, in the Greek, first in priority, in order, number one. First thing in your life. Seek, look after, go after, pursue, first and foremost, he says, the kingdom of God. First in time, in rank, first in succession of things, first. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you. Jesus has just been talking about don't worry. Anyone like to not worry? Anyone like to live a life without worry? Well, Jesus says, here's the thing. If you seek me first, he said, you won't have to worry about where, what you're going to wear and you know, what you're going to eat and all them basic things. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. That's, that's my commitment to you. I want you to seek me first. Though. I want you to put me first in life. You can put all that stuff first if you want, but that means God's not first. He's second or third or whatever. But Jesus said, if you make me first then I will take care of those things for you. Who, who, who thinks that it makes common sense, it makes sense to put God first, if God then says, if you put me first, I'll put those things first for you. Yeah? I think God has a better capacity to make things happen for me in my life than I do. And I work with him, and one of the ways I work with him is I do what he said, and he said, seek me first. Put me first in your life. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, it says this. It says, honour the Lord with your wealth. We don't just honour God with our life. Don't just honour God with our lips, our hands, our service, our time. The writer of Proverbs says, honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. They were an agrarian society. So back in the day this was written, uh, the Jewish people are living on the land. So they're dealing with cattle and they're dealing with agricultural issues and, and so on. And so he says, and first fruits of your crops, then... What's the then? It's after you've honoured me with your wealth and the first fruits of everything. In other words, once you've put me first, once you've put me first, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Who doesn't want their barns to be filled to overflowing? Who doesn't want their vats to be filled with new wine? And some of you went, yeah, secretly, but I won't tell anyone. <laughs> Nervous chuckling over there. So we don't just honour God with our lives. We honour him with our possessions as well. Our possessions and our wealth are a part of our life. Amen? They're a part of our life. And so if we honour God first in areas of our wealth, here's the thing, wherever you put God first, there appears to be scripturally a blessing that flows into that part of your world. Do I understand it? No. I just know that that's exactly what the writers of these ancient 66 ancient documents over 1,500 years put together. That's what these people believed as they walked with God, did life with God, journeyed with God, examined how God uh, worked with people and with nations. They came to this conclusion and it's repeated. If you put God first in an area, then God comes through in that area. Somehow God's blessing is on the areas of life that you put him first. So it makes sense that if we want the blessing of God in our life, then let's put God first. Let's put God first in all areas of our world. So I want to look this week at the topic of the tithe. Now, as soon as I say that word, I can guarantee you there's all kinds of emotions popping around on the inside of you. If anyone was thinking the church is just after your money, you're going, he's just confirmed it, he's going to talk about it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what we started with last week, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be, do not be what? 
conform to the pattern of the world. We talk, if you go back and listen to it, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. I want to say to you that for many people, there are so many misunderstandings about what tithing is and the issues that come around tithing. So here's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the tithe. In it, then after today, for the next few weeks, I'm going to jump from what we're going to talk about today straight over into the New Testament. And we're going to have a look at whether the principles and things we talk about today are transferable into the New Covenant, the New Testament, New Agreement, after Jesus came and did what he did. Is that okay? So if you've got a note taker, take notes. You can go back and have a look at this stuff so I'm not swindling you and lying to you. So we're going to go back and we're going to have a look. We're going to go way, way back in a second. But the most preached about verse on tithing is what? Come on, you've been around church for a while. People, what's the most preached about verse you've heard on tithing? That, that famous Italian prophet, Malachi. The Italian prophet, Malachi. Or Malachi, as some of us know him, chapter 3, verse 7 to 12. And I'll just give you a brief overview of, of what it says. I'm not going to preach on this. I just want to give you a bit of an overview. Here's what it says. Oh, I've just done something there. It says, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees. This is God speaking. In other words, they stopped living the way God wanted them to. We know that. Okay? You've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. And then he says, return to me. So in other words, you've moved away from me by not obeying me. I didn't move from you. You moved away from me by choosing to live a life that was not in obedience to me anymore. So return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And then God, there's this conversation. Then God says back to them, he says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. And then they say back to him, how are we robbing you? And he says this in tithes and offerings. Now, you can only accuse somebody of robbing something from you if it's lawfully yours. Is that correct? So what God is saying here is there's something in your possession that belongs to me. And you're not giving it back to me. It's in your possession, but it belongs to me. Right? And you're robbing me because that which is in your possession that belongs to me, you won't give it back to me. So in essence, you're robbing from me. This is what he's saying. He says, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Don't jump on this, we're going somewhere. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. In other words, Israel, there's a place where that tithe needs to go. And it's referred to as a storehouse. Now, if you go back and you look at uh, uh, what theologians and historians will talk about, the closest thing we have in the year 2022 in the modern world, in the New New Testament era, the closest thing we have to the Old Testament storehouse is actually your local church. Now, I know that, that you know, we've got all kinds of... I'm just telling you, this is, this is what uh, uh, New Testament scholars and theologians will tell you. The closest thing to the Old Testament storehouse is actually your local church, okay? And then he says this. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. In other words, I need food in my house too because things flow out of my house. So I need resource in my house because things happen in my house. Common sense, simple, we'll get into some of this stuff later on. So there may be food in my house. Then he says this, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there won't be room enough to store it. Test me in this. One of the very few times you're going to find God anywhere saying, you as a mere human being and mortal, test me. Remember when Jesus was being tempted? Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Jump off this mountain, all this stuff. Well, here, God's saying, no, no, I want you to test me in this. I think God knows the human heart. He knows the attachment we have to wealth and possessions. And so he says, look, I'm I'm, going to make a a decision here. I'm going to allow you to actually test me in this area because I know how how attached we get to our money and I know how sacred it feels to us and I know the world we grow up in tells us that it's the most important thing in life. And so he says, I'm going to give you a bit of leniency, cut you some slack. I'm going to say to you, Uh, actually test me when it comes to this. He says, and and see if I don't do something. He says, I'll throw open that that word floodgates of heaven. The only other time that phrase is used in the entire Bible is in the Old Testament when it talks about the heavens opening up and the rain coming down and the flood of Noah. It's the only other time this phrase is found in the entire uh, uh, Hebrew Old Testament. He says that if you will do this for me, he says, I'm going to do something for you. So whatever, whatever this type of blessing is, we know that it was related to them giving of that which God considered his in the first place. Okay? 
So they've got something that's considered God's. They're not giving it back to him. He says, you're robbing me. He says, if you'll actually give it back to me. In other words, just do what's right. Just give me back what's mine. He says, I'm going to pour out this uh, blessing. He calls it opening the floodgates of heaven and so on. And he says, I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit because it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed. In other words, if you just do what's right and bring it to the storehouse, I'm going to do something in your world. I'm going to bless you in such a way that all the nations of the world, they're going to see something on you. How would they call you blessed unless there's something evidentially on your life? And I'm not saying it's gold rings and dripping in diamonds. What I'm saying is that there's something evidential about you. The peace of God, the blessing of God, the, the, the contentment that comes with knowing that the presence of God is... Whatever it is, all we know clearly is that he says, if you, if you bring the tithe to the storehouse, I'm going to take control of the uncontrollables. He talks about uh, uh, the locusts and the pests that devour your crops. They couldn't control that. They couldn't control that kind of stuff. If you're an agrarian society and you're living on the land and the locusts are swarming and coming, you can't control that stuff. But God says, here's the thing, put me first, I will take control of the uncontrollables of life for you. And I will open the windows of heaven and I'm going to bless you. There's lots and lots of interpretations and conjecture and ways and places that people go with this. But what we do know is this, God says that if you will return to me the tithes and the offerings, bring it to the storehouse, he says, here's what's going to happen, I'm going to do something really, really cool for you. I'm going to do something really, really good for you. No matter how you interpret the passage, everyone agrees that it's saying something about the tithe and something about its relationship to God and to his people. So we can't just disregard it because it's a bit hard to understand or because of weird things we may have heard. But what I want to do this morning is not dance around that one. I just want to give you a bit of an outline of that. What I want to do is go back, way, way back, like in the movies, let's go back, way back, to the first time the tithe is ever mentioned in the Bible. Now, tithe simply means this. It means what? 10%. That's what tithe means. Tithe means 10%. So that's why if you give 10%, people say, oh, you're, you're a tither, you know. If it was 20, it'd be a twithe, right? You'd be a twither. If it was 80%, you'd be either. And if it was 90, you'd be neither. There you go. Following that logical sequence of events. But tithe simply means 10%, right? Simply means 10%. Now, the first time it's mentioned is Genesis 14, verse 18 to 20. And here's how it reads. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, he was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to the God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth, or a tithe, of everything. Abram's been out, had a battle, won. Out of that victory, he has taken some spoils. What he had has increased. He's come back, and this uh, person called Melchizedek, the king of Salem has come out to him and greeted him and it says that he gave a tenth of everything to this guy, mysterious man, called Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is only mentioned two times in the Old Testament. Two times. First time is here in Genesis 14 and the next time is in Psalm 110 verse 4. Now, Psalm 110 is a prophetic. Those of you that don't understand what prophetic means, it means it, it was written... It was written at a time pointing to the future about something that was going to happen. So it's a prophetic psalm about Jesus. And here's what Psalm 110.4 says. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. This is speaking of Jesus. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So here's this mysterious Melchizedek character appears again. That's the only two times we hear anything mentioned about him in the Old Testament. So we're starting to see a little bit of a connection here between this guy called Melchizedek and who was going to come down the track in the future, the guy called Jesus. There's this connection being made in the Psalms. There's some kind of connection going on here. Now, he's also mentioned in the New Testament only by the writer of Hebrews. Now, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who that was, but we do know this. He was writing to a Hebrew audience, a group of Hebrew believers who turned to faith, who were thinking of turning away from Christianity because it was getting tough. They were thinking of turning away because it was just getting a little bit hard. And he writes to them and he talks a lot about, if you go back, here's what you're going back to. But here's why Jesus is better. If you go back, here's what you're going back to. Here's why the new covenant is better. Here's why God is better. Here's why what Jesus did is better. If you go back, and, and so he's got these comparisons. But he talks about Melchizedek and here's what he says in Hebrews 7 verse 1 to 3. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. 
He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. We just read that story. He's coming back from defeating some kings and he blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now watch this. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Have you ever heard of anybody else referred to as the king of righteousness? Maybe Jesus? He's the king of righteousness. And then also the king of Salem, which means king of what? Peace. Anyone ever heard of another character who's referred to as the king of peace? Maybe possibly a guy called Jesus. You might have heard of him. Well, Jesus is also the king of peace. Without father or mother. Doesn't that sound interesting? Without genealogy. Without beginning of days or end of life. Resembling the son of God. He remains a priest forever. So here's what we know about this mysterious figure Melchizedek from these passages, right? We know that before there were ever 12 tribes initiated, you go later on, I think it's Genesis 49, somewhere there you see these Israel broken up into 12 tribes. Then one of those tribes called the Levites are appointed to be priests, right? Melchizedek is a priest before there was ever any priests. He was a priest before God ever created a priestly order, right? So Melchizedek is a priest before there were priests. Secondly, Melchizedek is referred to as the king of righteousness and the king of peace. We know that. Same as what Jesus is, referred to the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Jesus, by the way, was also a priest before God outside of time. He's been the son of God always, beginning and end. Jesus didn't just suddenly appear. God didn't just suddenly appear on the scene when Jesus was born. And the third thing is that Melchizedek brings bread and wine to Abraham. It's interesting that he brings bread and wine to Abraham. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like communion, doesn't it? So before the Passover, here's the thing, the communion that, that was celebrated when Jesus sat at the Last Supper was not the same way you and I take communion. He was celebrating something that happened years and years ago in the Exodus. You all remember the story? Now, if you're visiting here today, we don't normally get this sort of deep, but I'm doing this for a reason. So you go back to the story of Israel being under bondage in Egypt and God comes along and he sets them free. Do you remember that? And as a, as a part of setting them free, um, there's a, a process where Israel is told, kill an animal, put the blood all over the doors and the windows of your house and the angel of death will come and when he sees the blood, he will leave your family alone and he will go. And the Egyptian uh, children were born, firstborn, uh, were, were killed and the, the, by that stage, Pharaoh had finally got the point and kind of said, that's it, you Israelites, get out of here. We don't want to keep you in bondage as slaves anymore. Changed his mind later, chased them, didn't work out too good for him. But what Jesus celebrated at communion was actually the Passover. So when Jesus stands up and says, take this bread and do it in remembrance of me, what do you think those good Jewish boys there would have thought? Oh, hang on, no, 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 we've been doing this for decades this is, this, is our, we, this is about the Exodus and Moses, the central figure. Moses is the central figure who let us out. What are you talking about, Jesus? But Jesus says, no, no, no. Do this in remembrance of me. Drink this in remembrance of me. Can you imagine what that must have been like for them to sit there and go, hang on a second, you are changing the entire meaning of this thing. Or was he? Maybe he was just bringing it back to the original meaning. Abraham, the father of many nations, the father of faith, takes communion with Melchizedek, who sounds to me like a picture of Jesus. And they have communion well before the Exodus is ever established. Melchizedek's a priest well before the law is established and there are priests and so on. Sounds to me like something's going on there. He had no father, he had no mother, no genealogy, no beginning and no end. Melchizedek sounds to me like a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. He comes on the pages, he takes communion with the father of many nations. We don't know where he came from, we don't know where he's going, no lineage, no birth, no death, all that stuff. That just sounds awfully outside the realm of being a normal human like you and me. It sounds to me like he could have been an image of the Son of God that was coming and Psalm 110 tells us that there's a linkage here between Melchizedek and who he was and what he did and Jesus when Jesus comes. So, it kind of sounds a little bit like Abraham gave a tenth of everything to Jesus. Kind of the image that's being presented there. He gave a tenth of everything to Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do now. We're going to examine some of the principles we see here in the first ever mention of the tithe. Okay? In theology studies, there's this thing called the law of first mention, 
which means go back into the Word of God and find the first time that something's talked about. And you'll get some principles and some things out of that that will carry on all the way through with that particular thing. And so we're going to go back and I'm just going to pull out in the remaining time we've got three simple things that I see in this very first instance where the tithe is mentioned. Now what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to go into the New Testament. We're going to look at these same three points. We're going to see if they're transferable into the New Covenant and into the New Testament. Now the first thing we see here about Abraham is this. Abraham gave voluntarily. We think tithe, we think law. We think legal requirement. Abraham gave a tithe voluntarily. The first tithe ever given was given between 300 and 600 years before a law was ever given to Israel. Think about that. You ever heard anybody say, oh, we don't have to tithe, we're not under law? Tithe didn't come about with the law. The first tithe was three to 600 years before law was ever given to the nation. So people who say, well, I don't have to tithe anymore because I'm not under law, you don't understand the tithe. You've got a wrong understanding of it. All you're doing is looking at, the, at the, the, the law that was given to the nation of Israel. And by the way, if you go and look at the law of tithing the way that Israel was given it, here's the thing, they gave anything, their tithe was anything between 22 and 36%. It's between 22 and 36%. If you take all the different various tithes and stuff under the actual law that was given to Israel through Moses, there's 22 to 36% is what they gave. And they called it a tithe, but it was more than 10. But here we're going back and we're seeing that when, Mo, when, when Abram gave this tithe, he gave it voluntarily. There was no law that said he had to do it. He chose to do it. He chose to give it. The principle of the tithe never entered through the giving of the law, so neither does it exit with the passing of the law. Again, we've got to renew our minds when we hear that word, because we hear the word tithe, we think something. But it is what we're thinking, actually, what these ancient writers told us. 300 to 600 years before the law was ever given, a man tithed to God. I think that's really, really important. So Abraham's had a victory. And he decides to give a tenth of his spoils or his increase to the priest and there's no legal requirement to do it. See, under law, Israel had to give, but Abraham didn't have to give because he wasn't under law. He was not under law. Israel had to give, Abraham chose to give. Israel had to give, Abraham chose to give. Do you see the difference? I'm hoping anyone sitting there thinking tithing is a legal requirement. No, it's not. And it never was. It became a legal requirement later on, and we're going to have a little look at, at some of that. But it came and it went as a legal requirement. It's almost like the law is this thing that gets plopped in the middle of human history, but there was stuff going on before it, and stuff that continued after it, before it came and after it left. And tithing, the image we have biblically of tithing, this is one of those things. He wasn't coerced into giving because there was no law. He actually initiated it. Think about that. He was the one that came up with the idea. He came up with the idea. It was a man who said, I'm so grateful to God, I'm just going to give something. I'm going to give something. And now I believe that God put the thought into Abraham's heart to do that. That's what I believe. Because here's the thing, I think God knows that as human creatures, we need to learn not just how to receive, but we need to learn how to give. We need to learn how to give. And so I think that's something that God put into his heart. Proverbs eleven twenty four to 25 says this. It says, One person gives because they feel guilted into it. One person gives because they feel manipulated. One person gives because they're afraid that they'll suffer dire punishments if they don't. Now it says, One person gives freely. Yet what's the result of giving freely? It says, He gains even more. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly or withholds more than is right, some translations say. In other words, what you've got, give. Some people withhold more than is right. In other words, there's a part that's not right to withhold. There's a part that's not right to withhold. And it says a generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So there's something that we have to scatter, and there's something that we have to withhold. You don't scatter everything, and you don't withhold everything. But there's something that you scatter 
And there's something that you give freely and there's something that you withhold. A little bit like we talked about last week with um, uh, 2 Corinthians 9.10, where it actually says that now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread. Seed and bread. You do something with seed, you do something with bread. Budget your bread, sow your seed. Budget your bread, sow your seed. So we see this principle kind of popping up here and there when it comes to, to, to God and when it comes to finance. So the first thing is that Abraham actually gave voluntarily. He didn't have to. The second principle is that Abraham gave systematically. There was a system to how Abraham gave. So what was his system? Well, he gave a tenth. Now, why did he give a tenth? This is an interesting question. And I've done a lot of research on this and studied it out. Now, let me tell you theologically and historically the conclusion people have come to as to why he gave a tenth. If you've got a piece of paper, write this down because people will ask you and this will be your answer. Why did he give a tenth? The theological, historical answer? We have no idea. We have no idea why this man chose a tenth. If someone comes and tries to tell you, then ask them, where did you get that? I want to know. Because nobody knows why he chose 10%. 10%. We don't know why. And keep in mind, he decided to do this before God said, I'm going to come up with all these laws, and here's how. He decided to do this voluntarily, but he decided to do it with a system in mind as well, and he gives a tenth, and we don't know why. So Israel tithed because it was legalized, but it wasn't for Abraham. In fact, it almost looks like men instigated the principle of the tithe, and God latched onto it, doesn't it? Almost looks like Abraham came up with this great idea, and God went, now that's a good one. I'm going to get a piece of action on that one myself. Let's do that with the whole nation. Yee-hoo! We don't know why 10. But I don't believe it was his idea. I believe that God was doing something through Abraham to show us as time went on. There's a reason why that little obscure story is here, considering everything that would have happened in the life of Abraham, everything that happened in the history of Mech, for some reason, these particular events are recorded. If even Jesus' life, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think it's John who says at the end, this is not everything Jesus did and taught. In fact, if everything Jesus did and taught was written down, there wouldn't be enough libraries and books in the world to contain it. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit moved upon people and said there are certain things that need to be recorded. And it's recorded that he gave a tenth. And the truth is, we do not know why. But let me just throw an idea at you, maybe. Maybe it's so that everybody could be included in this process. Can you imagine that if Abraham gave, and, Abraham gave $100 and that became the way that it worked? And from now on, all throughout history, everyone has to give 100 bucks. Well, what about the poor person that earns 120 bucks a week? They give 100 and they're stuck with 20 now, will God come through? Yes, I believe God blesses and all that sort of stuff, but you know, I can understand why they might feel just that little bit ripped off. Because God, you just took 90% off me. You know? And so, and what about the person who earns 1,000? And they get to give 100, but they keep 900? They're kind of feeling like, yeah, well, this, this is a good deal for me. I'm happy with this one. You know? See, the reason I think it's a percentage is because that way everybody has the opportunity to be involved in what God is doing here. Everybody. 10%, everybody gets a chance. It doesn't matter. Nobody is excluded if it's a percentage. If it's an amount, there could be many people excluded from the opportunity to engage with God in this thing of giving and experience the blessing that he talked about back in Malachi. I'll, open the, I'll, I'll bless you. If, you. if you tithe and bring it to me, I'll bless you. Well, some people would be excluded if it was a set amount. So I wonder whether in the wisdom of God, that's why Abram said, I'm going to put a percentage to this, not an amount. I wonder. Do I know that for a fact? No, I don't. But I do know this, that God wants to get things to us, but he also wants to get things through us. And because God wants all of us to be involved in what he's doing, whether it be uh, uh, preaching the gospel, whether it be uh, 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 looking after the poor, whether it be you know, fighting for justice, whether it be whatever, it's also in this area as well of finance. He wants us to get a grip on the way that he manages money, the way he says that the financial world should operate so that he can be involved in the financial system and involved in that financial part of our life. He wants us to put him first. So I think maybe the beauty of a tithe is it's a percentage. Everybody can get involved in that thing. See, the tithe removes the pressure of equal amount but provides the opportunity for equal sacrifice. It removes equal amount, but it puts everybody on the same page because maybe it gives us all the opportunity 
to sacrifice on the same level. Everybody can get involved. So Abraham, three points. Abraham gave voluntarily. Secondly, Abraham gave systematically. And thirdly, Abraham gave gratefully. Abraham gave gratefully. He said this, said, Blessed be God the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Melchizedek says to him, You're blessed. God's delivered your enemies into your hands. Abraham has just had a great victory, a great success, and I can imagine that in that moment, Abraham is grateful for what God has done in his world and the victory that he's had. And out of that gratitude, out of that gratefulness, it says that he gave a tenth over to this person called Melchizedek. Blessed be God most high, who has delivered you, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Abraham came back from battle with more than he had when he went out there. And I think this was a grateful response from Abraham for what God had done in his life. In other words, I'm already blessed. I'm already blessed. And because I acknowledge the blessing of God that's already happened on my life, from that place of gratitude and gratefulness, that's where I give. See, God has given you so much already. And I know there are people in here and some of you are looking around going, yeah, well, that guy's up here. and I'm de-. No, 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 God has given all of us something. Deuteronomy 8 says this, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. God gives you the ability, the capacity, the skill set, the opportunity to generate and earn an income and earn a living for your life. If God's the one that gave you the very breath, All he's got to do is take away that first breath in the morning. You ain't going to work that day. If you ain't going to work, you're not earning nothing, are you? But he doesn't. He gives you that breath. He helps you get out of bed. He gives you the, the, the ability. He gives you the ability and the capacity to earn an income. God has given us so much already. So the three things, the three principles that we see, we're going to go into the New Testament Next week, and we're going to start to look at these and see, are these trans... Because if they're not in the New Covenant and New Testament, then maybe we can chuck the tithe out. But I just want to go into the New Covenant, New Testament, and have a look and just see whether these principles are there. But when you think about tithing from now on, here's three things we've just talked about. That tithing is voluntary. Abraham, the first tithe ever given, was given voluntarily, not under pressure or coercion. Secondly, it was given systematically. There was a system to it. It wasn't just some random, well, I'll just give if I feel like it, when I feel like it. It's interesting. I know some people that say, I don't tithe, but I just, just, just you know, because God owns everything. It's interesting. Most people I know who say, I don't tithe because God owns everything, Give very little anyway. Because God owns everything. You know, yes, God does own everything. But he still said to Israel, even though he owned everything, he said, here it is, give back to me that which is rightfully mine. Even though I own it all, I could keep the whole 100% if I wanted, but I'm not, I'm going to give it all to you. And you just give back to me that which, I, that which I'm asking of you. This is the way it worked under the old uh, covenant with the law. You just give back to me the percentage that I'm asking for. In other words, it's an obedience thing, isn't it? under the law. It was an obedience thing. But he had a system to it. And thirdly, Abraham gave gratefully. It was a a grateful response for what God had done. Now, I just want to finish with this. Let's look at the second time the tithe is mentioned in the Bible. Second time. It's with a guy by the name of Jacob. Genesis chapter 28, verse 20 to 22. And here's what it says. Jacob, he, he, he has an encounter with God in a particular place. And then he says this. Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me Now note the language, if, if, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all of all that you have given me I will give you a tenth. Can you see the difference between Abraham and Jacob? Abraham's going, if you will do this, and then you'll do that, and then you'll do that, and then you'll do that, and then you'll do this, and then if you do all these things, then I'll make you God and I'll give to you. Jacob's going, if, if, if. Abraham goes, because you have. Because you have. Jacob was, was going to give uh, voluntarily. Jacob was happy to give voluntarily. No one was making him do it. Jacob was going to give systematically. He said, I'll give you a tithe, no dramas. 
But he wasn't necessarily coming from a place of gratitude, was he? God, there's something else you've got to do first. Abraham just said, no, no, no. God, you blessed me. And I'm just going to start doing this. Abraham gave from a place of gratitude for what he had. Jacob was saying, when I get grateful for the things you have to, you're going to do, and here's the things I need you to do. I wonder, actually, whether, again, it's just a wondering, because that kind of ended up being the way the law went, didn't it? Jacob said, well, here's the deal, God. If you, if you, if you, then I will. I wonder whether God flipped it and went, sweet, no worries, as a nation, okay? If you, if you, if you, then I will. You want to play that game? I'll play it too. Let's play it for a few hundred years. And then I'll send my son Jesus, we'll wipe that out, and hopefully we can go back to having a proper relationship. But it's not some legal contract, but a grace, love-filled relationship that we have with Jesus. Jacob, if you will, then I will. Abraham, because you have, I will. Abraham gave out of conviction of the goodness of God upon his life. Jacob said, well, if you do, if you do, then I will. He was going to give out of convenience. When it's convenient for me, God, then I'll do it. Are we going to be givers like Abraham, or are we more like Jacob, still sitting back waiting for something else to happen before we decide to allow God to get involved in the financial part of our life? That's a question we all got to think about. Here's what I know. The best way to become a cheerful giver is to look at the blessing you have, not the ones you want. Look at where you are, not where you want to be. Because each of us are blessed of God. So next week, what we're going to do, we're going to take those three principles, voluntary, systematically, and gratefully. And we're going to jump all the way over the law. Forget that period of law. We're going to jump right over it because we started outside of the law, haven't we? Everything we talked about today is outside of law. We're going to jump right over the top of the law. We're going to land in the New Covenant, the New Testament, and we're going to look at those three principles and see, do they still have a place in, in the financial world and in our giving and in our life and our relationship with God outside of law? Because I believe this, that the tithe is not a legal requirement in the New Covenant, just like it wasn't in the Old. I believe it's voluntary, just like it was in the Old. But I believe it comes out of a grateful heart. And until we recognize and get grateful for the things God has done for us, if we're always sitting, looking, waiting for something else, God, when I have $1,000, I'll give. When I earn $5,000, I'll start giving. God, when I've got this bill paid, I'll start giving. Here's the thing. We'll be just like Jacob. You just keep pushing the bar back and back and back. I'd want to be like Abraham and go, God, you know what? You have blessed me where I am right now. And I'm going to start this process right now. Remember, in Malachi, God said, test me because I know it's hard for you to get your head around it. I know that the first thing you think about is you're going to miss out, but God made it very clear to them, if you start doing this, you're not going to miss out. I am going to look after you. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for uh, this opportunity again this morning. And uh, look, Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you just speak? God, speak to us about that part of our world, God. Father, we desire in our hearts to just live the way you want us to live. And the world tells us that this is important and that's not. And the world tells us that, you know, God's interested in that, but he's not interested in this. But Lord, this, this book is about the whole of life, every single thing to do with life, not just the spiritual, religious kind of stuff. Lord, you made life and you know how it works best. And so, Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you just continue to speak to people in this place, Lord? God, it's a private and a personal thing. Yep, I get that. And nobody is being told to give. Nobody is being manipulated or pushed. Or God, we just want to look at the word of God as it is and then let people make their own decision based on what they're seeing, Father. So thank you for this morning, Lord. Just seal in people's hearts the things you've been speaking to them, Lord. And God, as we leave this place, go with everybody. Keep us safe in the week to come. And God, I pray this week, give each of us the opportunity to bump into somebody out there that doesn't realize how loved they are by you, God. Somebody that doesn't know about your death, burial, resurrection. It doesn't understand that you did something for them 2,000 years ago, that God is so powerful that today you can break chains, you can set people free, you can change lives literally if they would bow their knee to you and start following you, God. Give us the chance to be that voice and to tell someone about you in the next seven days, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Bless you guys. Um, hang around, tea and coffee. If you want to hang around for tea and coffee, feel like the Holy Spirit's saying stuff to you again, talk to somebody about it. Don't just get up and... Let it disappear. Ask the person next year, can I pray for you? You got any needs right now? Be the church to one another. Amen.